throughout my life, until the Japanese invasion, I believed that I was one of the luckiest people in the world to be born in the British Empire and to live under the British flag. And it is no exaggeration that every night when I say my prayers, we were all Roman Catholics, I used to thank Jesus for his great, great gift to me of being born in the British Empire. But when the Japanese invaders, Malaya and Singapore, and when the unconditional surrender of 100,000 British soldiers to 30,000 little Japanese soldiers took place, this whole world in which I had been living unto then was completely shattered. In the 19th century, the heyday of empire, Britain used to send a gunboat or a regiment to stamp on any threat to its colonial interests. The Ashanti in Africa, the Sepoys in India, the Egyptians in Alexandria. In 1982, Britain sent a task force to seize back the Falklands, one of its last and most distant colonies. This expedition aroused again the spirit of an empire ready and able to look after its own. I'm very glad that we had a sense of honor. We weren't going to let the British territory be overrun. I'm glad that we had still the almost Elizabethan sense of gamble of being prepared to send a task force 8,000 miles away without assured air cover to recover what we lost? Well, we said we would do it. We then proceeded to do it, and the world was amazed. And I think there is no doubt at all that it put the bee bra back into Britain. I was very disturbed because it really meant a restoration of colonialist feeling. Yeah. Oh, it was hardly hidden in the case of Mrs. Thatcher and mem members of the government. But it in, in indicated again uh, a readiness uh, to go to war in order to maintain a, a, a distant part of the world as part of the British Empire. Until the start of this century, the empire flourished thanks to the occasional use of brute force. This allowed the guardians of empire to conduct their business like gentlemen. When Sir Edward Elgar composed his imperial theme song, a few Britons ruled a quarter of mankind. It was the biggest empire the world has ever known and seemed as permanent as the waves. I was very proud to be part of the empire. I used to love seeing the map with the red on it. And uh, I was also proud of being an Australian, of course, but we were part of the empire, a very important part of it too. England was home to us. In fact, people here in my day referred, when they were going to England, they always referred to it as we were going home. So it was as close as that. And our loyalties very much lay in England. I wasn't directly aware of the pressure of the imperialist government. It merely was an atmosphere in which they controlled everything and told you everything. And as you knew nothing else, you went along. Uh, colonialism then was so integrated with the West 
that those of us who urged that uh, imperialism should be ended were regarded as crazy. Aden, Bahamas, Barbados, the Suto land, Bechuana land, Bermuda, British Guiana, British Honduras, Brunei, Cyprus, Sierra Leone, Singapore, Somaliland, Tanganyika, Trinidad and Tobago, Uganda, Western Pacific Islands, the Windward Islands, Zanzibar. The empire was too much to take in. To some it meant a sacred trust, justice and democracy, progress and civilization. To others it meant vicious oppression, alien autocracy, exploitation. To Noel Coward, it was all just a bit ridiculous. It's such a surprise to the Eastern eyes to see. That though the English are effete, they're quite impervious to heat. When the white man rides, every native hides in glee. Because the simple creatures hope he will impale his solar topi on a tree. It seems such a shame when the English claim the earth. That they give rise to such hilarity and mirth. <laughs> but mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday, 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 out in the midday sun. That sun, they used to say, never set on the British Empire. When the new King Emperor, George V, visited Delhi in 1911, he knew that behind the pomp and circumstance, lay the unswerving loyalty of the Indian army. In the First World War, two and a half million colonials joined up. It was their readiness to die that gave the British Empire its victory. But the cost was so high that millions felt this must be the war to end all wars. We began the No More War movement after the war it was taken up amazingly throughout the world and we had uh, uh, simultaneous demonstrations oh, in the capital of very many countries indeed and of course we not only demanded no more war we demanded the end of imperialism which was so largely the cause of war the First World War led to nationalist uprisings against imperial control. In India, Britain rode out the storm. But near home in Ireland, and at the imperial crossroads in Egypt, Britain was forced to yield. The end of empire had begun. In 1920, Britain had responded with a propaganda gesture on a grand scale. The heir to the throne was put to work, together with his friend and relation, Lord Mountbatten, what did one really know about the empire? Very little. Most of it was hard to get at. There was no air travel in those days, and practically no films to reveal it to us. So all I knew was what I'd read and heard. My cousin, the Prince of Wales, was the most popular figure at that time. It was considered that nothing could be better for empire relations than a tour around it by the Prince of Wales. The Prince and Mountbatten sailed right round the world, even calling it tiny colonies like Trinidad. I was teaching at Queen's Royal College, and I achieved the honor of shaking the hand of the Prince, which a whole lot of people didn't, because you can't shake too many hands in a day or two. Wonderful, but it first made me say, what? What are they fussing about that? I shook his hand. I walked wrong with him and then he said goodbye. In fact, often it was a problem of protecting him from his enthusiastic admirers. Quite early on, he started the practice of shaking hands with his left hand because his right hand was almost crushed with the warmth of people's greetings. I was taking him to town, of course, and the crowds were absolutely hilarious with excitement. And even then, he, he, he was very young then, of course, with very golden hair, very attractive looking, and with great charm. And it came across, even, even though you were watching him from a window, that everywhere he went, people were enchanted by him. And all the girls, of course, were charmed off their feet. 
After six months, the Prince and Mountbatten returned to Britain, secure in the belief that Britannia, or more exactly her Royal Navy, still ruled the waves. The British Empire had been built up by the superiority of British naval power over any other country, really dating back to the Armada. It took a little time to develop. But the British Navy was the link between the different parts of the English-speaking world. It was the self-governing dominions of India or the colonies. So it was absolutely central and vital. I suppose we regarded the Navy as being the cement of empire. I'm sure it, it was just that. It was our sure shield in those days, and we thought of it as such, and we were a part of it. The senior service expected to be taken seriously, at least most of the time. Behind the bravado, the awkward truth was that after World War I, Britain was deeply in debt. The British could not afford the naval supremacy they took for granted. Both Japan and America would soon be able to outrun and outgun the Royal Navy. So in 1922, a great conference was held at Washington, where the major maritime powers concluded a strange defense agreement. Britain broke off its treaty with World War I ally Japan, and all the powers agreed to limit the size of their navies. In a spirit of economy and no more war, many ships were scrapped. Well, more is a pity about the Washington Treaty, I think, as so often happens. We, the law-abiding citizens, stuck to it, others did as they liked. It was a, a disaster in many ways for us. We had to sink the Australia outside the heads. There's no more war. War for civilization has been won, and we could uh, relax and live, live under the Washington Treaty. The Washington Treaty, in the words of my uh, great boss, Admiral Lord Cunningham, uh, he said, that was the end of the uh, Royal Navy and uh, of the British Empire as the first naval power of the world, the beginning of the end. And this meant that um, instead of having overwhelming superiority in the Indian Ocean, the Pacific and the Atlantic and the Mediterranean, we were really reduced to the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. And so we built the base in Singapore so that we would be able to reinforce the Indian Ocean, and therefore Australia and New Zealand, as well as India and Malaysia, if there was a crisis. Key British bases had long locked up the globe. Gibraltar and Malta for the Mediterranean, Aden, the Cape, and Ceylon for the Indian Ocean, and at the foot of British Malaya, commanding the Oriental trade routes, Singapore. Now that Britain had neither the money nor the ships to maintain a Far East battle fleet, nor Japan as an ally to do the job, Singapore took on a new role. It was to become a base without a fleet. When British interests were threatened, a fleet would be sent from home waters and here fitted out for battle. We stopped uh, at the then completely undeveloped Singapore in those days, and I so particularly remember uh, going up uh, to what was eventually became the dock here, the dock, and it was just like seeing a, a vast sort of sandcastle marked out like a child's thing, uh, marked out in what was I've already unkindly referred to as a mangrove swamp, and you could just see the, the lines laid out, you see, and uh, eventually from that the dock was developed. The centerpiece of the new naval base was to be a massive dry dock, built in Britain and towed the 8,000 miles to Singapore. But construction work was spasmodic, 
It was pushed ahead, then cut back by successive governments. Finally, in 1938, it was finished. It was the largest naval dock in the world at that time, and it was deliberately opened at a ceremony with great pomp and show and publicity in order to emphasize the stability of British rule in Southeast Asia and the forces available to support that position. Singapore was a totally imperial creation, and yet it was here that Britain's empire was to suffer its most stunning defeat. Singapore had been founded by Sir Stamford Raffles in 1819 to dominate the trade between India and China. It grew under British rule into a bustling commercial metropolis. In the pre-war era, even then, we were very important in the uh, economic life of the British. We supplied rubber, tin, and these were the two main export earners uh, for the British. Our country exported these. Uh, all the export earnings landed in London. And these were the British. They not only took away the, the wealth of this country, but the executives who were here then, uh, their salaries used to run into thousands. Uh, and ours uh, had lowly jobs. Uh, we went to English schools, sang God Save the King, uh, rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves. So it's a kind of love-hate relationship. We like the English language and literature and stories, but we find that we didn't like the people who spoke them or wrote them. I felt that um, Singapore had become so commercialized uh, that uh, all the commercial values were coming first. That the people who were living there, of course, were living under conditions of very great comfort. I mean, everybody had plenty of servants and one thing and another, you know. Oh, one splendid moment. We all enjoyed it. The Sunday morning jaunt to the Sea View Hotel. Charming, beautiful, such service. And we all got plastered on usually the hard stuff. And of course, every session had to end by a singing of that notable song. There'll always be an England. While there's a country lane, wherever there's a cause, it's most beside a field of grain. There'll always be an England, and England shall be free. What went wrong with the dream was the lack of realism in the 1930s of the British ruling circles who couldn't believe in the danger that Hitler and Mussolini presented. And uh, they couldn't believe that anybody would be so foolish or so unrealistic as to embark on a policy of aggression and risk another war. You see, from the point of view of the military planners, there were two possible enemies. One was Germany, and one was Japan. And the deployment in peacetime uh, enabled us to, uh, to accomplish both functions. We were able broadly to balance the, uh, the forces of Germany and Japan. With war in Europe only a year away, Britain still asserted that Singapore could deal with the growing threat from Japan. Aloft again and headed for Singapore. Our hearts beat proudly as the Empire flying boat comes in. Britain's far-sighted leaders for generations have maintained strong forces at the Empire's strategic crossroads. But Singapore's real greatness is its link in the chain of Empire's strength and communications. On land, air and sea, Singapore's units are symbols of an Empire that is as free as the air and as permanent as the sun. Now, we depended, of course, upon the arrival 
of the Eastern Fleet. Remember, there was no war on at all then. The European War uh, Party were very busy planning the European War, but we in the Eastern War had to depend upon a mythical Eastern Fleet. We had a whole set of plans, which I happen to be responsible for, as a matter of fact, uh, developed for moving the Mediterranean fleet to the Far East. But of course, uh, when uh, the Axis War developed and then our battles with the Mediterranean, in 1938 we had to abandon that policy, and that was the beginning, really, of all Singapore troubles. Our interests in the Far East, which were very great, uh, could not be defended. It was really a, a, a situation of bluff more than anything else. Let's say that we, that we had forces out there, quite small ones, but uh, if we were really attacked and if the Japanese began to build up their strength, uh, uh, we would be in very great difficulty. Britain's leaders feared the Empire would not survive a war on both sides of the world at once. So, desperate for peace at almost any price, Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain flew to Munich and appeasement. This morning, I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. <laughs> We used to talk together about the problems of empire uh, very often. But it wasn't until, of course, the pressures in Europe built up to the point of near war that we had really to think in terms that we might have to concentrate everything on Europe and everything on our own survival and thereby, of course, uh, sacrifice uh, some of the uh, elements of defence which we've been able to deploy in defence of the empire, Australia, Singapore and the like. Uh, and so the, it was the, when the change came, um, and we had to concentrate everything on Europe, uh, Chamberlain, for example, had to telephone to the Prime Minister of Australia and say we could no longer provide the cover which we had done up till then. For England, it's the Far East. For us, it's the Near North. And we, as having been brought up in Australia, were always uh, aware of what we called in those days the Yellow Peril. Japan, the ally on whom Britain had turned its back after World War I, was now to take advantage of Hitler's aggression in Europe. At Singapore, Japan was to call Britain's bluff. While Europe was convulsed by war, Britain's Eastern Empire was still at peace. Singapore pursued its principal purpose, trade, confident of its own security. Here is striking and encouraging evidence of the tremendous British fighting power which guards the integrity of this bastion of empire. Wartime newsreels were principally morale boosters for beleaguered Britain. By passing on the optimism of official propaganda, they helped to spread the myth of Fortress Singapore. strategic points around the city, gun emplacements ring one of the most strongly fortified bases in the world. The garrison, which is being continually reinforced, is fully capable of maintaining Singapore as a city of the British Lion. Even the Americans, long the leading opponents of empire, put about the illusion. Long before the outbreak of World War II, the name Singapore had become symbolic of military might. For on this strategic island, Britain had built for its navy and those of its allies, the world's largest naval operating base. The facilities of Singapore, its machine shops and dry docks, were to be shared jointly by the allied navies. Some felt that the Japanese would not be so, so idiotic as to attack the Americans and ourselves uh, because if they did, they were bound in the end to lose. Uh, Churchill certainly felt that. And I heard him say to the Chief of Staff on more than one occasion, I do not believe that the Japanese will be so stupid as to do this. Even without the Japanese in the war, Churchill was desperate for American backing. 
He sailed in Britain's newest battleship, the Prince of Wales, to meet President Roosevelt. But the American president exacted a price. The two leaders signed the Atlantic Charter, declaring that they wished to see sovereign rights and self-government restored to those who have been forcibly deprived of them. The subject peoples of the empire understood these words to be a promise of democracy and self-government for all, including themselves. And they were in the future to quote the Atlantic Charter back at Britain. But Churchill never acknowledged that meaning. For him, all that mattered was winning the war. The officers and men of the Prince of Wales will always be ready to add another stage to the glorious and long annals of the Royal Navy. Against Admiralty advice, Churchill insisted on sending the Prince of Wales to Singapore. She was to have had with her an aircraft carrier as protection. But in the event, the fleet that arrived in Singapore to scare off the Japanese was only a few destroyers, an elderly battle cruiser, the Repulse, and the Prince of Wales. We went to Changi Point, which is, as, which, uh, is uh, on the coast in uh, Singapore Island. And we were there when, when somebody, somebody shouted, hey, look at those two ships. We looked and then we saw for the first time two large warships and somebody said, oh, they must be the Prince of Wales and the Repulse. And of course they were the Prince of Wales and the Repulse, the pride of the British Navy. They were sailing by majestically. The British then were showing the flag. And I can well remember as we steamed up the Straits of Johor, people waving to us. And I think there was this feeling in the, in the colony that you know, the Navy had come to the rescue. Now, I think our feelings about the Prince of Wales were that um, uh, we had a slight chip on our shoulder about the Prince of Wales because uh, uh, she was a slight glamour puss. She'd, been, she'd taken the Prime Minister over to uh, America. She'd had this scrap with the Bismarck. Uh, she'd been on a very important and successful operation in the Mediterranean and had been attacked by torpedo bombers, which had not succeeded in their attempts. And uh, uh, so I think there was a chip on Repulsive's shoulders about this. Immediately prior to their arrival, I had been up country, as indeed had all the Mitrippen, staying with various uh, kind, hospitable planters. And one picked up a little bit of the local feel there, which really was very, very content, very uh, unalarmed. Uh, the Japanese were bluffing. They, they'd never dare do anything like invade the Great British Raj in Singapore uh, or Malaya, as it then was, at all. And when there were saber-rattling noises uh, from the other side, from Japan, uh, these were poo-pooed. Uh, they wouldn't have the nerve, they'd never done. Anyway, what could they do? The current conception then was, uh, these slant-eyed orientals, their eyesight is defective, they are no damn use as a fire, uh, fire, uh, as a fighting men, as a flying men, and they cannot fly a plane properly. At dawn on the 7th of December, 1941, the Japanese, until then at peace with the West, attacked. They landed troops here in Malaya and bombed Singapore. Simultaneously, they destroyed the American fleet at Pearl Harbor. When it happened, uh, the Prime Minister was delighted in, in a sense. Well, he, he was horrified at what happened uh, at um, Third Harbor, but he said, well, now nothing matters because the Americans are on our side and we're bound to win the war. Therefore, whatever we lose, we'll get back, which is perfectly true. And he had all along taken the attitude, rightly, that, that getting the Americans on our side was the only thing that mattered. We had been told the Japanese couldn't fly at night. It was something to do with their eyesight. And I remember this red warning. We were at peace, remember. And I think this happened at about the same GMT as the attack on Pearl Harbor when suddenly the searchlights went on and there were nine Japanese bombers in perfect formation flying at night 
about Bomb Singapore and we opened fire with our 525s in fact from the dry dock at the time, first time we opened fire at the enemy. ちょうど、シンガポールは、あ、ネオン First pictures of Singapore's taste of aerial war reveal the damage done to Raffles Square in the heart of the island shopping center. Department stores, shops and business houses. The same old story with street clocks registering the early morning hour when death and destruction came at the hands of Hitler's yellow brothers. It's all very typical of the Nazi Nipponese Brotherhood. This part of the empire calls out for strong and immediate action. My father was the captain of the Prince of Wales. She was the flagship of Admiral Phillips. And uh, I had dinner on board with him uh, by invitation shortly after they got in. And I hadn't seen my father for nearly a year. And we had a very uh, relaxed uh, family dinner, supper, really, in his cabin, nobody else present. After dinner, uh, we sat on the sofa, and he turned to me and said, what do you think of the situation? And I, in my youthful extremity of ignorance, really, uh, said, let them come. Uh, let, let's have a crack at them. And I remember very clearly his then turning a most serious face to me and saying, I don't think you have any idea of the, the enormity of the odds we are up against. And the captain sent for me and he told us roughly, told me roughly what was going to happen. We were going out to try and intercept the transports which were landing troops in the north of Malaya and in Siam. And he said, I can remember, he said, I'm afraid it's going to be a pretty sticky party, guns. The Prince of Wales and Repulse set out to stop the invasion from Japan. What happened next was to inspire the Japanese to make a full-length feature film for their wartime propaganda. It accurately follows the accounts of the men who took part. そのそれに間違えたんじゃないかと思って一番それを心配してもしそのこの船を間違えて私たちが沈めたのはこれはそんなことになると思ってそれを一番まず心配しますそして近づいて行動を避けて近づくというと向こうでスターってたくさん撃ち
that sort of thing, but it didn't affect the ship in any way. But the next wave which arrived was an altogether different cup of tree. And these were the chaps who really did a mortal blow. It was the most brilliantly executed operation. One has to give them that. It was their first 11. Now, don don Migie Mari Nagara, Stai Ste Orimashtaga, Atakino Batasia Soju Ste Orimashte, Suichu and Mimasen de Staga, Atakino Shiro not the Orimashta, Tesatino, Maika to Hio Hayasta, Ito Heso de Sega, Tasho Atarimashta, Oite, Meshe, Taite, Okinakoe, Yorkon de Shmashta. You know, they just kept coming, really, after that, and, um, I think we were hit by five torpedoes and we gradually rolled over. Everything was firing. The chaps, it was very difficult to get them to break off a target once it had dropped its torpedo because they were, they were fighting mad by then, really. And I can remember her gradually capsizing. And it was just as if one was in the cinema. It was quite impersonal. I wasn't upset or anything. I was looking at something as if I wasn't there. This absolutely dead calm sea and this beautiful great ship, so many of one's friends in it, gradually rolling over and then capsizing. And then, of course, you know, there were masses of heads bobbing about in the water and, um, uh, and in true British style, everybody started to sing, roll out the barrel and uh, all this kind of thing. And I can remember swimming around, telling people to shut up and keep their mouths shut because every time they opened their mouths to seeing roll out the barrel and uh, a great slob of oil fill went down their throats and of course this was lethal because um, it, it just burnt your innards out and um, so I remember going around uh, destroying all this great elan by telling them to shut up and keep their mouths shut if they wanted to stay alive. Word came through that they were being attacked by air and of course we didn't have a carrier with us, or they didn't have a carrier with them. I was in the war room, and very shortly afterwards, just as we were trying to arrange for further tugs and things to go out to help them, we had nothing else available. Word came through, well, the Admiral who was in charge of the war room, Admiral Palliser, put his head through this couple and said, Needn't worry about the tugs, they've both sunk. The Japanese celebrated the sinking of so formidable a foe, the pride of the British Navy. Eight hundred and forty men died in the two ships including Captain John Leach. I suppose in hindsight, it wasn't a very good gamble. And it, it must remain, I think, barely conceivable, inconceivable even, that just two ships like that could have deterred, let alone in the event stopped, the Japanese from doing almost anything they wished in the area. To that extent, it was utter waste. When Churchill sent the repulse and the Prince of Wales, there was an electric shock throughout the country when they went down. But again, it was covered up. Business went on as usual in Singapore. Parties were held in Raffles Hotel, New Year parties and Christmas parties. They went on and uh, the European community just had complete faith in the British and so had we. The British had always been supreme and we just couldn't envisage the British being defeated and we accepted. Oh, the Jeff and the Wolf and the Hun They'll be sorry for the war that they began They must pay the price, those three blind lies The Jeff and the Wolf and the Hun Germany and Italy, not Japan, were Britain's front line. For Churchill, the Far East came a poor second to Europe. He could not spare the equipment Singapore needed. The Japanese swept through Malaya, even though they were outnumbered and often fiercely resisted by combined British Empire troops. 
Within seven weeks, they were poised for the final assault on Singapore. Churchill ordered the British commander, General Arthur Percival, to fight to the last man. The situation as it was here, with uh, over two million civilian population, all the essential services broken down, the dead weren't being buried, uh, the fire services broken down, the police and so on, uh, and no water supply. Uh, once the causeway was blown up, then we had no water. And in the last days, there's no doubt that Percival was a very, very worried man. I've seen him many times sitting at his desk with his head in his hands, and he obviously, you know. In the early evening of Sunday the 15th of February, 1942, a weary British command made their way to the Ford car factory, the Japanese headquarters. General Yamashita arrived to accept the British surrender from a wretched General Percival. I speak to you all under the shadow of a far-reaching military defeat. It is a British and Imperial defeat. All the Malay Peninsula has been overrun. Singapore has fallen. The Japanese commander himself could hardly believe it. 130,000 British Empire troops had surrendered to a quarter as many Japanese. That night, there, there was an uncanny silence in, over the whole island. The shelling stopped, the sirens stopped, no more bombing, and everybody had fear in, 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 in their heart. To us, that you know, we, that seemed to be the end of the world. There was no hope, no future. And when uh, capitulation came, it was a traumatic shock. <clears throat> An unbelievable shock. It's uh, a ghastly end of the world that just didn't penetrate. We were frozen. We were like zombies. Well, before the uh, Singapore uh, 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 surrendered, before the fall of Singapore, most people thought the British, you know, were very wonderful. They could uh, uh, protect Singapore. And we were, in fact, we were given to understand that Singapore was impregnable. And in the end, Singapore really fell. And that exploded the myth of the British, you know, they could do everything. In military terms, the fall of Singapore was not crucial. But for the empire, its effect was shattering. Belief in British superiority crumbled. Australia had been the first to react. Australia looks to America, free of any pangs as to our traditional links with the United Kingdom, announced Prime Minister John Curtin. Now I confess to you frankly, but with the sincerest devotion to the cause of the British Empire in the world, I have fought as hard as I can for our state. It is perfectly true that I made a direct and definite appeal to the United States of America. I think it was a very, very brave and a very uh, clever adjustment to his thinking that he made, and I give him full marks for it. I was uh, personally delighted, of course, because I have such high regard for the Americans, and I'd just as soon almost be saved by an American as saved by a Briton. I mean, there it was. Somebody had to save us. Industrial and independent, Australians have been turning to new markets and new interests outside the empire. When war touched their continent for the first time, Australians found that for their defense against Japan, they must look to the United States more than to the Empire. And in the very presence of and need for American defense forces, they glimpsed a future inevitably bound up, not with the Empire alone, but with the United States as well. 
Thousands of Indians were led by the fall of Singapore to support Japan against Britain. Well, I think the impact was tremendous. Uh, as I said, you see that uh, an Asian power could just do this, particularly the close upon the sinking of these two warships, the reduction of what Winston Churchill described as the impregnable fortress, you see, you see. Uh, naturally, and he had talked in those terms in just a few days before the event. Once that fell, you see, so uh, the British prestige you know, here in India was just, uh, well, actually it was just mud. For 170 years, the tradition of British authority and invincibility was accepted by the Indian people and respected throughout the Orient. Yet the Indians have felt that for all it has accomplished, British rule has been the rule of a conqueror. They have resented reactionary Britishers, who in defiance of a policy favoring greater equality and more independence, sought to keep the Indians in an inferior social and economic status. But to the complacency of the colonial British, there came an abrupt and shocking end. The Japanese overran Burma and even bombed Australia and India. The British Raj quaked as the new imperial rivals stood at their gates. India's nationalist leaders, Gandhi and Nehru, had at the outbreak of war wanted to back Britain. Now they demanded that the British quit India. Eventually, the Japanese found themselves too far stretched. The British pushed them back through Burma. Then the Americans, in August 1945, delivered the final blow. American atom bombs preempted British plans to reconquer Malaya and Singapore. All that was left for Lord Louis Mountbatten, Supreme Commander Southeast Asia, was to accept the Japanese surrender here in Singapore. Well, when the British came back, of course, we felt very happy. And uh, the, my happiest moment was when uh, the late uh, Lady Mountbatten invited me to the city hall to, to witness the surrender. That was a great moment for me. I have today received the surrender of the Supreme Commander of the Japanese forces as you have been fighting. And I have accepted the surrender on behalf of all of you. This was the moment the colonial peoples had been waiting for. Now the British would honor the promise Churchill had made in the Atlantic Charter. Well, frankly, I cheered that the British returned uh, for a whole lot of reasons. One, it would mean the end of the Japanese conquest. It would also mean the beginning of the end of colonialism and the road to independence. And of course, the return of players, cigarettes and three fives and so on. The Japanese cigarettes were pretty horrible. And, uh, but after the reoccupation, we did notice that the British were less arrogant. They had been educated during the war years, a bit more conscious that the world uh, did not altogether depend on Britain. Uh, the war changed the whole political climate of the world. Uh, it had been stressed so much that it was a war against dictatorship and fascism and for democracy that uh, that feeling spread throughout the world and uh, I would say that it was the impact of the war which had which made the great change Victorious Britain was in no hurry to keep its wartime promises. The British recovered every inch of the empire, which Churchill said, stands more united and powerful than at any time in its long romantic history. He was wrong. 
Britain was exhausted, on the brink of bankruptcy and overshadowed by its wartime allies, Russia and America. A wind of change was blowing through the empire, arousing nationalist demands Britain would prove powerless to resist. continues next week with a detailed examination of India's part in the British Empire. Stay in view now for a news break, followed by our first Sunday stereo special. Leonard Bernstein conducts a brilliant recording of West Side Story. <laughs>